Well, everybody, welcome. Thanks for coming to today's Authors at Google Talk. We are absolutely delighted to have Dr. Peter Henry, the Dean of the Stern Business School, here with us today. Um, he's here, first of all, to talk about his new book, Turnaround, Third World Lessons for First World Growth, uh, which talks about, in pretty interesting detail, what the first world can actually learn from what the third world has been living through for the last number of decades. And he has some pretty interesting takes on it that, that he'll share with all of us. Um, before he does, though, I'd like to uh, embarrass him a little and give a little about his background. I had a choice of sort of a one-line bio which said he's the dean of the Stern Business School, or the more extensive one, and, and I'll go a little bit longer. Uh, he's not only the dean of New York University's Stern School of Business, uh, but in 2008, he also led President Obama's presidential transition team in its review of international lending agencies, such as the IMF and the World Bank. Uh, he's a member of a number of prominent boards, including the National Bureau of Economic Research, the Council on Foreign Relations, and the Kraft Foods Group. Uh, he received his PhD in economics initially from MIT, and that was followed, uh, or sorry, preceded by a bachelor's degree from Oxford University, where he was also a Rhodes Scholar. Uh, and his studies at uh, the University of North Carolina, where he was a Moorhead Scholar, and a finalist in the 1991 campus-wide slam dunk competition, um, which I think is probably the most retweeted part of his New York Times interview <laughs> that he did a few years ago. Uh, he was born in Jamaica, but lives in, in New York with his family. Uh, and we are absolutely delighted to have him here. So Peter, we would love to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, really, really uh, thrilled to be with you. So we're at a really important time. And that's, that sounds uh, trite to say, but uh, there's a reason for it. Uh, the world economy is in a, an unprecedented period. And I just want to start off by giving you uh, a few numbers that, uh, that capture uh, the essence of why I, I think the ideas in turnaround are so critical uh, to all of us. So from 2002 to 2007, uh, the world economy experienced its most rapid uh, period of growth in recorded history. So since the time in which we've had uh, GDP growth numbers, macroeconomic statistics essentially, uh, which is uh, really roughly over, over, over a century, uh, we've never had a period uh, during which the, the world economy has grown as fast. From 2002 to 2007, the world economy grew at 4.9% per year. But just to put that in perspective, uh, it's important to understand that emerging economies, what are now called emerging economies, really drove that growth. Uh, so emerging economies grew at something close to 7% close to per year, whereas advanced economies grew uh, at just uh, under 3% per year. So emerging economies are driving global growth, and emerging economies uh, have turned themselves around from what were formerly known as third world countries to now become emerging economies. And what's really critical is that given uh, where we are right now, so 2002 to 2007 was a great period for the world economy. We're in a much less robust period. Uh, in 2012, uh, the advanced nations of the world uh, grew at only 1.3% per year. Uh, Europe actually contracted. Uh, Europe's in recession. Emerging economies still grew at 5.3%. So in the aftermath of a uh, financial crisis from 2008 to 2009, from which we're still recovering, and very importantly, uh, we know from uh, work by, by a number of scholars, including uh, Carmen Reinhart and Ken Rogoff, that countries recovering from financial crises, when financial crises are the cause of the recession, Countries grow much more slowly when they recover from those kinds of recessions. And that means we need emerging economies to continue to grow at rapid rates in order to pull along uh, the advanced world as it struggles. And in particular, advanced nations now look a lot like third world nations did three and a half decades ago. High debt, slow growth, and a lack of direction. And the central idea in turnaround is that the history of the formerly third world, uh, its history with the struggle of economic reforms, teaches us three really important things that we need in order for the advanced nations to get back on track. And so I want to share with you very quickly what those three things are, and then I want to explore them in a little more detail. So what are the three key lessons that we can learn from emerging economies. The third world turned itself around through discipline. And discipline doesn't mean fiscal austerity. 
I'll define it in a second. Clarity. And I, the example of clarity I want to use comes from the, the, the small, tiny island of Barbados, an even smaller country than where I come from, Jamaica. And trust is also critical to turn around. And I'm going to argue that the emerging nations of the world that are so critical to driving global growth suffer from a trust, what I call a trust deficit with the first world. And the trust deficit, the lack of reciprocity and respect <clears throat> of the third world by advanced nations threatens the willingness and ability of third world leaders to continue on the path of discipline and clarity that has produced these record rates of growth that are so critical to our shared prosperity. Right? So that's, that's the book in a nutshell. But what I'd like to do, uh, is I think it's important, every, anytime you talk about macroeconomics, it's easy to get lost in sort of GDP growth rates, rates of inflation. Economics ultimately matters because we're talking about people. The reason why it's so critical that advanced nations only grew at 1.3% last year is because there's unemployment. 1.3% is below what economists call the trend rate of growth. In advanced nations, it's about 2.2%. In the United States, it's a little higher. It's about 2.7, 2.8%. So when countries grow below their trend rate of growth, unemployment tends to rise through something called Oaken's Law. And so that means if we're growing below potential, we're not living up to our potential, it's really hard to create jobs. And jobs are important, not only for incomes, but for dignity. So what I'd like to do before going further is just to share with you a short passage from Turnaround. I'd like to read a short passage from Turnaround that I think provides some context for understanding why, why economic growth, why does economic growth even matter? Why are we talking about this in the first place? So with your permission, I'll do a short, uh, short reading. This is from the first chapter of the book. Growing up as a little boy on the island of Jamaica in the early 1970s, I cherished the time I spent on the porch of my grandmother's simple two-bedroom ranch house in Kingston, the nation's capital. There, at Three Windy Way in Harborview, a middle and working class neighborhood at the southern edge of the city, I would sit on the brown speckled tile, leafing through the pages of Encyclopedia Britannica, reading Bible stories, and poring over back issues of National Geographic for hours on end. As sea breezes stirred the needles of the casuarina trees that lined the front yard and shaded my world from both the sun and the gazes of people passing by on the sidewalk. Scents from grandma's kitchen, pumpkin soup, baking bread, brown sugar, and lime juice wafted through the air. Things only got better as the day progressed and the sun made its arc through the cobalt expanse of the Jamaican afternoon sky. The approach of evening was always my favorite stretch of time. A welcome pause between the heat of day and the fall of darkness. Grandma, finished with her cooking and housework, would come outside and sit with me in the early evening air. Encouraging children to read and dream was what Grandma, a former school teacher, did best. And she'd never missed an opportunity to work with one of her favorite students. Sitting together in the fading light, we lost ourselves in conversation. Accompanied by the pulse of chirping crickets, the reverberating reggae beats from a nearby rum shop, and the animated voices of young men playing soccer in the street. These are the sounds of the Caribbean, the lyrical backdrop to Grandma's outdoor classroom, where I asked question after question about the people and places I had encountered in the day's reading, and my ever-patient teacher shared with me facts and figures about distant lands. Yet the greatest lesson I learned from my grandmother came not from something she read to me but from something she did for someone else. In Jamaica, as in many developing countries, poverty is never far away. On one occasion, the ambient sounds of those Caribbean evenings gave way to the piercing call of a woman at the front gate. <laughs> 
Mrs. Henry, Mrs. Henry, you do so? Me beg you, make me come in. When poverty calls to you from the gate, you have to make a choice. You can avert your eyes, perhaps even turn your back and harden your resolve not to engage. But poverty will still be there looking at you, even if you don't have the courage to return its gaze. Soon come, Grandma called out as she lifted her tiny, slightly hunched frame from the chair next to me, walked across the tiles, stepped from porch to carport, and made the 30-foot journey to the gate. Good evening, Miss Mama. How are you? Miss Mama's appearance belied her reply. Me all right so far, Mrs. Henry. Miss Mama looked anything but all right to me as I watched her follow Grandma toward the porch. The closer Miss Mama came to my sacred classroom, the sharper the contrast I discerned between her and my beloved tutor. With bare feet, tattered clothes, matted hair, and a protruding belly seemingly at odds with her thin frame, Miss Mama appeared to be from an entirely different planet than my grandmother, who, with her pressed and starched cotton dress and neatly groomed appearance, was the quintessential school teacher and matron of the Anglican Church. After inviting Miss Mama to sit down next to her and across from me, Grandma asked Miss Mama if she was hungry. Miss Mama replied, Yes, Mrs. Henry. It's long time me not eat, you know, ma'am. My grandmother disappeared inside, then emerged a few minutes later with a large tumbler of milk and a plate of warm hard dough bread dripping with butter. I sat there, watching Miss Mama eat and listening to the exchange. My grandmother asking questions in the Queen's English, Miss Mama responding in Patois. They continued on for some time, Miss Mama chronicling her tough circumstances, my grandmother offering words of comfort and encouragement. Until the last crumbs disappeared from the plate, the milk was drained, and my grandmother sent Miss Mama on her way with a familiar Jamaican benediction. Walk good. I don't know how Miss Mama got her name, and I don't know where she came from, but I can picture her today just as I saw her in that first encounter in late 1977 when I was eight years old. Over the next several months, Miss Mama appeared at my grandmother's front gate with increasing frequency. One day in 1978, following what turned out to be the last time I saw Miss Mama, I asked my grandmother, Grandma, Miss Mama has a big belly, so why is she always hungry? My grandmother replied that some people have big bellies not from eating too much, but because they never get enough to eat. For me, economics is all about Miss Mama. I was drawn to the subject because I wanted to help people in developing countries like my native Jamaica help themselves. Feeding the hungry is an act of kindness. Providing the hungry with the means to feed themselves is an act of empowerment that confers dignity as well as nourishment. My grandmother was too old and lacked the technical training to give people like Miss Mama that kind of enabling assistance. I wrote this book because I have no such excuse. Helping people to help themselves begins with a simple observation. Never in the history of the world has a country sustainably reduced poverty without significantly increasing its population's average overall standard of living. The gains from economic expansion may not be evenly distributed, so growth alone is not a sufficient condition for development, but it is absolutely necessary. Without growth, life becomes a series of zero-sum struggles directed at preserving one's share of limited resources. With growth, the pie expands and the politics of distribution no longer involve such stark trade-offs. Because economic expansion provides the most reliable means of enabling the poor to lift themselves out of poverty, the critical question is, what kinds of economic policies lay the foundation for growth? The economic policy decisions implemented in the months and years ahead will determine whether people eat or starve, live or die, and not just in emerging economies. The financial crisis of 
drove record numbers of people in, in the United States into unemployment, foreclosure, and poverty, to say nothing of the devastating impact of its aftershocks on the economies and people of Europe. Whether in the first world or the third, there is no place to hide from the power of policy. So that's why I think economics matters. That's why growth matters. And that's why macroeconomics, the big picture, if you will, is critical to our shared prosperity in the future. So what I'd like to do uh, briefly now is to talk about these three elements, discipline, clarity, and trust. These lessons uh, from the third world struggle with economic reforms that have so much to teach us here in the first world and advanced nations about how we create more prosperity here and abroad. So discipline. Discipline is not, does not mean fiscal austerity. When people talk about discipline in the context of economics, and, I want to and I, in, in the book I talk about what discipline means in the context of free trade, uh, capital flows between nations, and, and other economic policies. I won't go into, into, into detail on all of those here today. We can ask, certainly have uh, questions about that during the question and answer period. But I want to focus on fiscal policy. What does discipline mean, discipline mean in the context of fiscal policy? Because there's so much discussion about fiscal policy right now in the newspapers, whether it be in the United States, uh, Western Europe, uh, or, or Great Britain. So discipline, I define discipline to be not austerity, not the willingness to take extreme measures, but discipline means a sustained commitment to long-term prosperity, a sustained commitment to a pragmatic growth strategy that is disciplined, that is uh, vigilant and flexible and values what's good for the country as a whole over what's good for any individual, interest group, or person running for political office. That's what discipline means. And in the context of fiscal policy, discipline is actually no more complicated than the story of uh, the ant and the grasshopper in Aesop's fable. So I have, I have, four, uh, I have, four, I have four sons, so, so bedtime stories are, 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 are good, a good way for me to get, get a grasp on, on, on how to make things very simple. You know the story of the ant and the grasshopper. Uh, during, uh, during good times, during the summer, the ant saves. It has a surplus so that when the winter comes, uh, it can run down, the, it, it runs down the surplus. The grasshopper had a party and didn't have anything to eat during the winter. First world grasshoppers and third world ants is what I'd like you to keep in mind. And I want to give you two, two very specific examples. Let's take the United States and Chile. In 2001, the United States, uh, we, had a $236 billion fiscal surplus. We decided to give that surplus back in the form of tax cuts. We gave uh, tax cuts back and ran deficits during that period from 2002 to 2007 I mentioned earlier when the world economy was booming. Basic economics teaches us that we should have done exactly the opposite. <clears throat> you save when times are good, just like the ant. And we know the rest of the story. And the story generalizes beyond the United States Advanced nations as a whole between 2002 and 2007 were running fiscal deficits of about 3% of GDP. So when the crisis hit, we didn't have a cushion and debts are now where they are. Chile, in contrast, during those boom years from 2002 to 2007, copper, Chile's principal export, the price of copper soared in large part due to rising demand in the emerging world, uh, building of cities, building of homes, wiring of offices and, and homes, and cities. As the price of copper was booming, the Chilean treasury filled up with revenue. And the people of Chile in 2008 took to the streets and burned the finance minister, Andres Velasco, in effigy, asking him, not, well, asking is a polite way, demanding that he returned the people's money, so to speak. He said, no, this is money for a rainy day. When the financial crisis hit, Chile had a surplus. They were able to institute a $4 billion tax cut package to help cushion uh, the blow of the recession, the financial crisis, and to help the poor. Third world ants, first world grasshoppers. So, Discipline in the context of fiscal policy, again, doesn't mean austerity. It means running countercyclical fiscal policy, saving for a rainy day.
Second point, clarity. I mentioned that I want to tell you a story from the tiny island of Barbados. So you may say to yourself, what can you, what can you learn from a small island? Well, I think there's a lot we can learn from a, a small island. In 1992, Barbados was on the brink of uh, financial ruin. Uh, they were running out of foreign exchange reserves, and their currency, the Barbadian dollar, uh, was pegged to the U.S. dollar. 1.7 Barbadian dollars for each U.S. dollar. It had been pegged since the early 1970s. The United States uh, economy was in recession. We had a credit crunch. Barbados, heavily, being heavily dependent on exports, in particular tourism, was suffering. The International Monetary Fund went to Barbados and said, sat down with the leadership and said, we think that you need to devalue your currency. You need to change the parity from, let's say, 1.7 Barbadian dollars to one US dollar to, let's, let's just call it two. Let's make that number up. <clears throat> Barbados said, no, we don't want to do that. We, there's, a, there's a reason why our exchange rate is fixed. We're a small island. We import much of we consume. And if we devalue our currency, we're worried that this is going to set off an inflationary spiral. As the cost of imports goes up, people are going to demand much higher wages, and this is going to set off higher costs, and we're going to get into a spiral. But the IMF said, but, but Speaking of costs, much like Europe today, outside of Germany, wages have risen too quickly so that production costs, unit labor costs, have made you uncompetitive. How are you gonna, how are you gonna be competitive? So rather than just saying they weren't gonna devalue, the leadership in Barbados said, okay, we've got, a, we've got a serious problem on our hands. We've got to propose an alternative. So what they did is they got together the unions, the owners of corporations and the government all sat down and they could see that the way around this problem was that they needed to cut wages. The problem, of course, is no one likes to have their wages cut. Raise your hand if you like to have your wages cut. <laughs> so what do they do? Well, a 9% wage cut was on the table. Uh, the government decided they were going to go ahead with this. Uh, a public sector wage cut. The public sector unions took a strong opposition to this. And 30,000 people took to the streets of Bridgetown, the, the capital of Barbados, in protest. And just to put it in context, there are only 250,000 people in Barbados. So this is roughly an eighth of the population. This is like 40 million people marching on Washington in protest of cuts in government, government federal wages. And to the credit of the leadership in Barbados, so the, the wage could have been, been, been uh, proposed by Prime Minister Erskine Scanford. The leader of the trade unions, um, Sir Leroy Trotman, had been against the wage cut. But when he saw this protest, to his credit, he changed his position. He said, we can't, this is not good for the country. We can't have this. They resumed the three-party talks. And I'll just come to the end of the story very quickly. The leadership of the corporations opened the books to workers and said, hey, what we're, what we're going to do is we're going to, have a, we're going to have a negotiated agreement that in the future, wages, wage increases will be tied to productivity. So therefore, we're going to share the fruits of prosperity in such a way uh, that we can keep wages in line with productivity so that costs don't get out of control. The union supported this, the government didn't devalue, wages were cut by 9%. Within a year, the Barbadian economy had recovered. For his troubles, Prime Minister Erskine Sandiford and his, and his party were kicked out of office for 14 years. When asked in retrospect, would you do it again? The Prime Minister said, or the former Prime Minister <laughs> said, the price I paid was a small price to save Barbados. That's clarity. That's clarity of purpose and understanding what discipline meant in that context. Barbados, yes, it's a small country, but the problems in Barbados are very similar to the problems that, that Europe outside of Germany faces today. Wages have risen too fast relative to productivity. Countries aren't competitive. And just to connect clarity to discipline, 
Discipline doesn't mean austerity in a European context. It means more reform and less austerity. Last point before opening up to questions, trust. I made the claim that the trust deficit, the lack of trust between emerging market nations and advanced nations stands in the way of our future prosperity. What do I mean by that? Generalize now from Chile and Barbados to the larger emerging market countries, the so-called BRICs, the Brazils, the Indias, and South Africa's of the world. The BRIC nations account for roughly 21% of global GDP. Brazil, India, China, all of these countries in their own way have practiced discipline. And I say it's important to say in their own way because discipline, what discipline means for specific policies differs from country to country. That general definition applies. It's sustained commitment to long-term prosperity. It's pragmatic. It's flexible. And what, what, pragma what pra pragmatic means depends on the cultural context. It depends on the political context. It depends on the country's natural resources. There's a whole range of things that would determine what's the optimal strategy for a country to grow. But the common thread is discipline, a sustained commitment to long-term prosperity. Through discipline, these countries have turned themselves around, account now for 21% of global GDP, are driving global growth, but yet at the institutions that determine the contours of international economic policy, the Inter International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, these countries only account for 11.5% of the voting shares. They're underrepresented relative to their weight in the global economy. In contrast, the countries of the Eurozone account for about 24% of global GDP and have 32% of the votes. So we have an antiquated structure that, rep that, that reflects the relative importance of these economies in the immediate aftermath of World War II. The lack of recognition, the lack of reciprocity in international economic relations undermines the trust of leaders in the emerging world with leaders uh, in the advanced nations. And very importantly, makes it very difficult for leaders in the, in the, in the developing world to continue to sell to their electorates the need for more disciplined policies. Because by the way, there's a lot of work left to be done. It's not just advanced nations that need to, and, and certainly advanced nations need to learn the third world lessons for first world growth, but there's a lot of work that remains to be done in emerging nations. And in order for that work to, to happen, we're going to need cooperation. We're going to, uh, leaders in the developing world, in the emerging world, um, are going to need to be able to show their citizens that the advanced nations of the world are willing to do as they say, not just as, um, as they do. So, discipline, clarity, and trust. Looking at the history of the third world's struggle with economic reform teaches us that these three things, discipline and clarity, which build trust, in the absence of which we get a trust deficit. These are the key lessons whether it's fiscal policy, trade policy, uh, policy with respect to international capital flows uh, that are key for greater shared prosperity in the future. So let me stop there and take, uh, take any questions. Given the example of the Prime Minister in Barbados, are politicians de-incentivized to make um, long-term choices or maybe incapable given the election cycles? And then when it comes to public sector unions um, dealing with uh, elected officials, are they essentially negotiating with themselves? I think, what's, I think it's, it's certainly true that election cycles, in many cases, work against uh, officials making long-term decisions. And the principal motivation, frankly, um, for writing the book was the desire to raise expectations on the part of the electorate. So I wanted to, I wanted to take these examples and illustrate uh, to a general readership that discipline is a two-way street in many respects. So if we don't hold our leaders accountable to a higher standard, 
then we shouldn't expect them uh, to behave uh, with, with, with long-term vision. So yes, the, many of the incentives go against uh, making long-term decisions, but I think it's, uh, it's, in, it's incumbent on the electorate to actually hold their leaders to a, to, to a higher standard. And so the key point in the context of unions is the following. So if I'm in a, if, if, and, 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 and this, is, this is not to say that to, 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 um, to denigrate all the, the, the positive things that unions do, but it's a question of benefits for an inside group versus an outside group. <clears throat> and so if I can just generalize the question a little bit, um, in the case of Barbados, had they not given into the wage cut, those who uh, had jobs would have maintained their higher wages, but at the cost of greater unemployment to a larger number of people. And so the question is, how do you bring about shared sacrifice so that uh, not only um, over time, and in the case of Barbados, uh, you had higher wages over time by tying wage, wage increases to productivity. Um, so how do you not only get people to have higher wages, but how do you ensure full employment? Uh, and that's one of the critical uh, problems facing Europe right now is that those who are part of the inside group, those who are employed, um, are quite happy um, with wages that are out of line with productivity. But the youth in particular, people who are new entrants to the labor force, are locked out. And so we've got to reconvene the conversation. We've got to have a set of policies that make it, for instance, in a European context, easier to hire and fire workers so that companies will hire more workers. Um, so, uh, so again, I think there has, to, there has to be give and take on both sides. Um, I had a question about when you talked about the Barbados and how the corporations opened up, um, can you elaborate on what were the incentives for the corporations to do that or how the government um, kind of created that incentive for them? Sure. So in Barbados in particular, the hotel industry was a critical industry given, given, given tourism. And uh, speaking of incentives, I mean, the, the owners realized that, you know, when you've got 30,000 people marching in the streets, it's not good for tourism. <laughs> and so in that case, there was a realization that, okay, gosh, we have to share in this pain as well. We can't just leave it, this, this can't just be a matter of uh, teachers and, and firemen and policemen bearing the full brunt of this adjustment. We have to make some concessions as well. And the reason why I like to use the Barbados example is it shows that social cohesion, social, a social compact, social compromise is possible. But again, it takes leadership to point to people that it is in their self-interest to do these things. So on your first point where you, you, know, where you mentioned basically that Keynesian approach is, 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 is the way to go, given the current polarization in, in the political systems across the globe, I mean the US, but also Italy, France, the UK, um, aren't politicians not incentivized to actually do this, but, but make short-term decisions that will be better in the end just for their political future, instead of like making long-term goals that might be better for the country? Yeah, I think it's, it's certainly an issue, and my hope in writing this book is, just to, is to get uh, the discussion away from polar extremes that are really rooted um, in nothing more than opinions, and to just bring facts to bear. And so let me just, let me just, let me just share some facts that actually I think really highlight uh, why fiscal austerity is not the right approach, for instance. Right, so it's because it's it's not it's not my view. It's it's these are these are sort of are, are facts. So what do I mean by that? So one of the the, the ways in which um, I try to understand in the book what discipline actually means. It's not my view of what discipline is. It's a market view. So I actually ask the question: How does the stock market, or how did the stock market in these de emerging economies in these developing countries respond when governments implement big policy changes? You might say, well, why would you look to the stock market? Why is the stock market a useful measure of anything? Well, the stock market doesn't care about ideology. The stock market's not Keynesian or monetarist or anything else. The stock market cares about, will, pol will the policy that's enacted on average create economic growth in the future and reduce risk or increase risk? 
And so the stock market responds positively. What's basically telling you is that the, the impl implemented policy change is likely to create value. And so in the context of, high in, of, 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 uh, of fiscal austerity, what we learn is that in, there are 81 episodes over the course of uh, three and a half decades of developing countries uh, implementing fiscal austerity. 56 of those episodes uh, turn out to be implemented during uh, what's called moderate inflation, inflation below 40%. 25 of those episodes are during high inflation. In the high inflation episodes, the stock market responds extremely positively. It, it goes up by about 60% in real dollar terms over about a year uh, in anticipation of these, these policy changes. So austerity, so austerity is a value creating proposition when inflation is on the order of, you know, 300% per year or more as it was in, in, the, in the case of Brazil or Mexico in the, in the 1980s. When inflation is below 40%, the stock market falls by about 30% when governments implement fiscal austerity. So what that means for politicians, to answer your question directly in, a, in, in the current uh, European US context, is that implementing austerity in a two or 3% inflation environment is not a winning proposition. Uh, do, do politicians have the incentive to recognize that? I think that's, I think, I think politicians can, can at least agree that, uh, that growth is good. So that's why I wanted to get this message out. The stock markets are back to their pre-2008 levels that, that shouldn't be. Only if you don't adjust for inflation. So in, so in real terms, we're still below. And, and it's a very good point because there are a lot of reasons why stock markets have, have gone up recently. We've got expansionary monetary policy, corporate profits are high. And it brings me to the, the, the second point, which is that the stock market responding, responding positively to a policy change, again, going back to the passage that I read, is a necessary but not sufficient condition for shared prosperity. In other words, the stock market responding positively to a policy change is telling, it's telling you Yes, that policy, that policy change, reducing inflation or, or austerity in the midst of high inflation does create value, but that's just the first step. So in, 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 the, in the present context, even though stock markets are rising, there's still a question of, well, what's next? What do we have to do to, for instance, in the United States, restore trust between business and government so that firms start to invest again? Investment right now is a fraction of GDP in the United States is uh, down around 15%. About a decade ago, it was high, as high as 20%. That means on average, corporations, the private sector is investing uh, cl uh, close to a trillion dollars a year less per year than it was. And that's one of the reasons why we haven't seen a really robust recovery, a pickup in jobs and growth. And so the stock market is a very helpful place to start a conversation, get away from ideology, because we can ask the question, is this policy change likely to create or destroy value? But it's not the place to end the conversation because stability is a necessary but not sufficient condition for shared prosperity. Uh, thanks again for joining us. Uh, my question is around the uh, trust deficit you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And you gave example between uh, third and uh, third world uh, country uh, trust issues. How about the trust deficit uh, within US itself? and how it impacts our innovation and growth. I've seen some, no some numbers where uh, US was behind even China in terms of trust. And so are there anything we can learn from third world countries or to restore trust? Yeah, it's a great question. So there's a passage um, in the book that makes reference to a West Indian aphorism that my dad used to say a lot when I was a kid. And the aphorism is, you know, long road draw sweat, shortcut draw blood. It's almost self-explanatory. The long road makes you sweat. It's all, it's, there's, there's no easy way to get to the right place. And we've taken a lot of shortcuts, whether it be uh, uh, the financial markets uh, and all the things that went wrong. Uh, um, overextension of, of, of loans, people who couldn't afford loans, and all the, all the things that went wrong during the, uh, the run-up to the financial crisis where effectively we undermined trust um, in a number of ways um, between um, uh, consumers, lenders, uh, investors, uh, sure, uh, uh, shareholders and corporations. So 
you can't rebuild that overnight. And I think it's very important for us to remember, it's, you know, it's, as in many things in life, um, it takes a long time to build a reputation. It can be destroyed like that. So the lesson is, from, the, from third world nations that have, have worked so hard to get beyond where they were in the 1970s and 1980s, where there was a lack of trust, as reflected in low stock prices and lack of investment and low growth, to building that trust, that we need to take the long road. And we need to um, do the basic things uh, that are necessary in order, to, um, in order to rebuild trust. So there's no easy answer. Uh, we just have to do it. <laughs> uh, we just have to do it. Everything from um, uh, restoring confidence in lending to uh, uh, giving clarity about the future uh, so that businesses will begin to invest again. And I think if we just keep doing it, get on the right track and stay on the right track, uh, it becomes self-reinforcing. Um, it seems like some of the challenge that people are coming up with in the questions is this problem between the short-term incentives and a long-term vision. Right. So, but that also suggests some amount of democratization. So I'm wondering where some of your takeaways fit within the academic tradition that a little bit of authoritarianism is good. So yeah, trying to grow. It's, a, it's a great question. So it's certainly true that if you look out in the world, there are examples of countries that have been able to implement long-term policies, discipline policies, um, through authorita authoritarianism. But what makes me very hopeful is that there are also more than a few examples of complicated democracies that actually implement long-term value-creating policies. I think Brazil is an excellent example. So Brazil, in 1994, under the, under the leadership of Fernando Henrique Cardoso, implements the Real Plan, which basically cuts off inflation permanently for the first time. And is, but, 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 but what's really important is that following Cardoso, uh, Lula da Silva is elected in 1998 and was elected on a policy platform that many people thought that Lula was going to go back to the policies of old, uh, printing money to finance the deficit and would drive inflation back up. In fact, if you look at uh, financial markets in the run-up to Lula's election, uh, risk premium went up and really, really, really reflected that. But the genius of Lula was he had broad inclusive language but harnessed the market to deliver those goals. And Brazil is still a low inflation country today and it's provided that stability plus some more open markets, market friendly policies. So there are, there are examples, whether it be Brazil in 1994, uh, India actually under Rajiv Gandhi as early as 1986, beginning to move in a more market friendly direction. And an even more recent example, uh, a very fledgling democracy, uh, Indonesia in 1997, uh, during the Asian financial crisis, one, was one of the most uh, hard hit countries, an authoritarian country that made a transition to democracy. It's still a fledgling democracy. There's a way to go, but is doing a good job of managing its natural resources, which is typically a, a real problem. Um, and then there are the democracies like Ghana and West Africa. So I'm hopeful, I'm hopeful. And again, I, but again, I think your, your, your question's an excellent one because I think it, it, it points to the need for us in the first world who have gotten so paralyzed and divided to sort of look up and look out and say, gee, there are all these countries who, in fact, uh, sometimes we, we were teaching what to do in order to grow. They've learned the lessons. Now maybe we need to sit down and actually look at them more closely and, 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 and become students again and figure out how we get to yes. Hi, yes. Yeah, so um, just on the topic of economic growth, but then also versus poverty or uh, mm -hmm. reducing poverty, I guess sort of to the three points that you spoke to, um, to improving economic growth, would you say that those are also in line with the idea of uh, wealth distribution or reducing poverty or not necessarily uh, that the two go hand in hand? Right. So I would say that growth is a necessary but not sufficient condition for, for poverty reduction. So if you want to reduce poverty, you need growth. You need resources to deal with the issues. Now, is growth alone sufficient? Uh, probably not. Um, 
So let me give you a specific example, or, or, stability, or stability alone, which creates growth sufficient. So you, if you're a country that reduces inflation, so let's say you're, you know, you're a country like Brazil, stock market goes up because you've, 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 you've stopped the inflation problem, but now the cost of capital has gone down for corporations, but if you don't have policies that make it easy for companies to hire workers, or encourage companies to hire workers, then you're not going to see the kinds of employment and wage gains that you would see in an environment where, where you did do that. And so you need a combination of policies. Uh, and in that case as well, not only policies to create more, that will create more employment, um, but then you probably also do, you do need policies to, to directly address the issues of, of, of poverty, as Brazil did, in addition to its inflation stabilization policies. But importantly, it's the growth that gives you the resources that you need to deal with whatever, whatever range of societal problems it is uh, you want to deal with, whether it be poverty or, or something else. And one of the stories that I tell in, 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 in chapter two of the book is a story of my own native Jamaica, in which a very charismatic leader, Michael Manley, so in, in some sense, you know, very similar to, to Lula da Silva in terms of just sort of you know, raw charisma, brilliant man who was unconstrained by external reality, an oil shock that hit in the early 1970s, had a set of goals, including poverty reduction, um, but being unconstrained by what was happening uh, uh, with oil prices and, and economic reality, um, really drove the country into a terrible economic place. 13, almost 13 straight years of economic contraction, which drove poverty way up. So in many ways, the, the, the first rule of, um, of poverty reduction uh, and growth is to provide stability. Because without stability, uh, there's really nothing else. Um, but stability is a place to start, not a place to stop. So if I could uh, just ask one last question sure. as we kind of wrap up. Um, a lot of what you've talked about is a compelling thesis. It, it sort of makes sense. It hangs together. It, it seems premised on cases where things got really bad before mm. the leading figures sort of said, okay, I, I need to be disciplined. I need to be committed. I, I need to establish trust. Um, in the developing world, these lessons seem applicable. Are things bad enough mm. that people will listen, or do they need to get worse? <laughs> I, I sure hope so. <laughs> um, it's true. I mean, the the... The bad, I mean, the, 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 the good news is in some way the bad news in the, in the advanced nations. And I think Japan is a great example. So Japan has had a really, by any measure, uh, tremendous underperformance over the last two decades. And they've got a new central bank governor who's going to try a new approach to sort of to get rid of deflation and get the country going again. But what makes it so difficult for advanced nations like Japan and the United States to actually tackle their problems is the overall level is still very high. And so we become complacent. We become used to gridlock or underperformance. And so I hope things have gotten bad enough. Uh, and I hope that, frankly, that we can be motivated just by the things which, frankly, in this country uh, have always been sort of a kind of core value, which is our commitment to excellence. We shouldn't be satisfied with 2.2% growth last year and 1.3% growth in the advanced nations. Uh, those are low expectations. So I'm hopeful that, um, that people will return around <laughs> and, 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 and recognize that there, uh, there's a, there are a lot of lessons out there that are there for the taking. Mm -hmm. And that if we just rededicate ourselves to excellence, uh, there's a much more prosperous future for all of us. Thank you very much for taking the time and sharing you. your insights with us. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Thanks for that. Thank you.